So uh, a few quick announcements before we move on to our speaker. You all have the gyrator on your tables in the form of the QR code. So if you want to check out what's going on on the calendar and in the gyrator, uh, you can get it real time that way. Uh, there is one uh, specific event I wanted to flag coming up this Friday here at the Union League Club. There is a DEI Earth Day event. Our club in collaboration with the Maywood Proviso Rotary Club and the Aurora Sunrise Rotary Club is hosting a DEI panel event. Uh, the event is honoring Earth Day and sort of considering the uh, coalescence of environmental work with social justice and equity. So please do check that out and register for that. Uh, now, uh, as we move on to the speaker portion of the event, I think you all know the rules by now, uh, but if you're in the room, we will take questions at the end, try to be succinct and give us one question per person so that we can get as many questions as possible. If you're on Zoom, feel free to put your question in the chat box, and again, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. And with that, I would like to bring up to the podium our president-elect, Alita Williams. Alita. Sorry, I'm not as tall as all the rest of them. <laughs> Declan McGovern has been executive director of the Music of the Baroque since July 2017. Under McGovern's leadership, the ensemble has increased its audience and fundraising significantly, embarking on new initiatives such as the Baroque in the Park at the Prince Pavilion, the Ravinia Music Festival, free neighborhood concerts, audience appreciation stories, soirees, sorry, the establishment of Baroque Forever, the MLB's Legacy Fund, and the growth of Strong Voices, MLB's choral program in six CPS high schools. Prior to MLB, McGovern served as the general manager of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, where highlights included a nine-city European tour, an appearance at Heinz Field with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and a new summer series with the symphony. A native of Ireland, he previously served as general manager of the National Symphony Orchestra of Ireland, where he created the President's Concert, brokered new recordings, and embarked on a tour of Ireland. He was also chief executive of the Ulster Orchestra, where he appointed the orchestra's first American and first female music director, jo Joanna Follett. He has many other accolades that can be found in his bio in the gyrator. Please welcome Declan to the podium. Hello, everybody. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Just getting my laptop in place here so I can follow what's going on in terms of what you see on screen. Um, I'm really thrilled about this invitation. Uh, I think I first learned about Rotary, actually, in Northern Ireland. Uh, I was a producer with the BBC in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, from uh, 1998 to 2012. <clears throat> and um, one of my jobs was to adjudicate the Northern Ireland Young Musician of the Year, which is one of the events organized by Cumber Rotary Club in Newton Ards in uh, County Down. Um, there are other connections. Our office is based at 25 East Washington. We're in that building that's full of attorneys and dentists. And if you turn left out of that building and walk a couple of blocks, you come to the original home, the Unity Building, where your first meeting was held in 1905. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here uh, today. Uh, we're all about making new friends in our business, which is early music. What I describe as the foundation stone, the bedrock, if you like, of of music, uh, where so much of what we have known this century, the previous century and centuries before comes from our era of the 18th century. Uh, you know, genres and formats and forms and uh, musical uh, creations like opera, concertos, symphonies, it all comes from our era. And so we, we like to describe ourselves as the original of the species, if you like. And I thought uh, today, I would guide you through just a quick whistle stop tour of the history of our organization, 
We are a proud Chicago born and made uh, music organization, just as Rotary is. Um, and uh, we've had an exciting journey over the last 50 plus years. So I'm going to do this through uh, slides, so um, photos, because I think pictures speak better than words. So if we go to the first slide, you'll see a shot of our orchestra uh, and chorus in the Harris Theatre. We started performing at the Harris Theatre uh, 20 years ago. Uh, just when it was built in 2003, we're going to be celebrating their 20th anniversary in the fall. The lady you see on stage is our music director, Dame Jane Glover, and you'll see her on the next slide. Um, we're really proud that she's our music director. She has been a trailblazer for conducting, uh, and particularly as a woman conductor, she was one of the first women to make it as a professional conductor way back in 1975. Thankfully, today we see a lot more women appointed to music directorships and to principal conductor positions, but in the 70s, there were really not very many. Um, she, was, she was one of the first. She was born in the UK. She lives in London. Uh, she's been with us for 20 years. And um, she's one of the leading experts in, in the world, without a doubt, in terms of uh, conducting Mozart's music in particular. She's written two books on Mozart. Um, she conducts a lot in opera, as well as with uh, orchestras all over the world. She was a former music director of uh, the London Mozart players. One of the great things about music, again, similar to Rotary, is it will cross bridges and oceans and mountains and bring people together. And so we have this common language in music that's performed in every corner of the world. And it's an incredibly uniting force. And we feel lucky to be the custodians, if you like, and to bear that responsibility of performing this music and bringing new audiences in, uh, retaining the audiences we have, and hopefully passing on all of that to the next generation. Uh, the next shot is... Uh, if you're all Chicagoans, and I'm sure you are, this is St. Michael's Church in Old Town, and the man on the podium is the founder of Music of the Baroque, Tom Wickman, and uh, he founded the organization in 1972. He was an esteemed singing teacher and organist, uh, and, and still is, but in terms of these magical early days of Music of the Baroque, he was the driving force of creating this organization that specialized in uh, the performance of this earlier music. The music of Bach and Handel and Vivaldi. Uh, we also perform Mozart and Haydn. Now, they came the generation later. So for music historians, that's really the early classical period in music. Our period is 1600 to 1750. That's the Baroque period. But we've always played the, the, the music from the era that follows. Why? Because Haydn and Mozart were born out of the Baroque era. It's like what I was saying earlier on. The bedrock is Baroque music for so much that came later. Um, there's a nice shot of Tom. Uh, and here's a nice shot of Johann Sebastian Bach. We probably play more music of Bach uh, more music by Bach and Handel than any others, because these were incredibly prolific composers. Um, they were born in the same year. Both of them were German. Uh, Bach spent most of, actually all of his life in Germany. And, and many of his famous works, we just performed his St. Matthew Passion for Easter a couple of weeks ago, was written for the St. Thomas Church in Leipzig. I don't know if any of you have visited Leipzig in Germany. Uh, but he is the he is the godfather in terms of classical music. Even composers today will say, you know, who was the greatest influence? So many of them will say Bach. It all starts with Bach. And I think he was an incredible writer of uh, spiritually uplifting music, but also psychologically quite intense music, cerebral in a way that kind of um, gets us to, to think about life uh, and that kind of connection with another world. Um, film directors have used his music so often. The Silence of the Lambs uses use the Goldberg variations to great effect. Angela and myself just watched uh, Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans recently, and uh, he uses, uh, Spielberg uses the second movement from uh, the uh, keyboard concerto in D so beautifully. Um, I, I won't you should just watch that film for the for the section that has Bach um, uh, and 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 you'll you'll see what I mean. Um, of course, we record music. We make our own recordings. Uh, Bach's Mass and B minor, one of the great cornerstones of of Western 
uh, music uh, and church music and again uplifting this is the music I mean we know about soul music in the 20th and 21st century but actually way back in Bach's day he was creating soul music that will that will get you in touch with that that inner uh, uh, essence in all of us and um, the kind of thing that's hard to put into words but that's why we have music and by the way that's one of the things we love about our music because we really believe it'll it will touch everybody uh young people old people every background um every corner of the world because uh i guess that's the magical thing about music it it, it moves you and it it brings you to you know areas in life and sensibilities that are that are hard to um, put into words uh, as I say, Handel is the other big composer that we uh, perform all the time, born in the same year as Bach and um, spent most of his time in the UK. He was uh, friends and indeed the head of music, if you like, for both King George I and King George II. Um, at this stage, I'm going to play you your first musical clip of the day. Alida mentioned uh, Baroque in the Park. Uh, and this is uh, a show that we created actually to bring in new audiences and to reach enormous amounts of people. Usually when we're doing a concert, we'll get 1500 people at the Harris Theater. For Baroque in the Park, we'll get 6,500 listening to Baroque music for the night. So um, why don't we just play this clip and it'll give you a sense of um, this initiative that we did in collaboration with DCASE and, uh, and um, our board and our supporters. So please play the clip. Thank you so much. So uh, that's just a little, I like playing that clip because it kind of ticks a number of boxes. It's great uplifting music. It's open air. There's a lot of people there. We use the big screen. And that concert in 2018 made a huge difference to our attendances at the Harris Theater. So we noticed immediately, we, this was a week before we opened our season at the Harris. And straight off the back of that concert the next day, we saw a big spike in single ticket sales. So this is a very good way of inviting people in, um, getting them uh, in to, to, know, to know and experience our world as a sampler night, and then hopefully build a stronger relationship by becoming subscribers. Um, this lady, um, this is Barbara Butler. She's been our principal trumpeter from pretty much day one, um, not quite 1972, but pretty close to it. She's our longest serving uh, musician uh, in terms of instrumentalists. Um, we do have one singer who, who holds the title of the longest serving musician in music of the Baroque. But Barbara is a legend. She's a professor of uh, trumpet uh, in Houston at Rice, at, uh, Rice University in Houston um, and has held many top positions in American orchestras. Uh, and I wanted to mention her because it just shows the, the long heritage, if you like, and legacy and sense of responsibility that we have to the music um, culture and history here in Chicago. Um, and then this next person is Bill Buckman. Uh, Bill is uh, one of the bassoonists with the Chicago Symphony. So in our orchestra, most of the musicians either play with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra or with the Lyric Opera Orchestra. So if you like, that's their day job. They're, that's their tenured position. Uh, but they have time to spare every week, and that's when we use them uh, for rehearsals for our concerts. And people say, well, why do you hold your concerts at the Harris Theatre on Monday nights? Well, it's one of the few nights of the week that they have off, because they're going to be they're going to be working with Lyric Opera um, for the other nights. and 
also with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. So uh, that's why we always do Mondays at the Harris Theater and actually it works very well. So we have this incredible uh, family of amazing musicians, like truly amazing world-class musicians that play with Lyric and uh, CSO and then also play with us. And the reason they play with us is we bring a different palette, a different approach, a different color, a different sound world. And they love working with Jane Glover because she's just so good at, at getting what she wants in terms of this historically inspired uh, and informed approach to music that was written in, in uh, earlier times. Here's an example of one of our soloists, uh, Alison Balsam. Um, in her famous yellow dress, uh, she came uh, to our uh, season a few years ago um, and uh, did an amazing job. We usually bring in uh, an international soloist at least once a year in terms of an instrumental soloist, but our singer instrumental, our singer soloists tend to come um, more regularly for the various uh, masses and big choral works that we perform. If we move on to the next slide, we see another beautiful Chicago club. This time it's the University Club. So this is uh, an example of the kind of thank you events that we do for our supporters. Um, appreciation for the support we receive from uh, our donors. And uh, this is um, an example of a soiree, an intimate gathering, if you like, with a, with a famous well-known musical artist. That's da Jane did the interview in this case, and Alison performing trumpet, Stephen Altop, um, our harpsichordist. And then if we move on to the next slide, we, we, ha we have quite a lot of fun and music of the Baroque as well. 15% um, of our income comes from our annual gala. Uh, we hold it at the Fairmont Hotel. Uh, they're very generous to us. We um, put up our visiting artists there at reduced rates. It's a sponsorship deal. And we hold our gala there and give them that business. So that works very nicely. I think it's a good example of obviously companies working together, a nonprofit and a for-profit business. Uh, and that works extremely well. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, here's an example of some of the education work we do. So we have a program in six Chicago public schools called Strong Voices, and we deliberately go into neighborhoods that, you know, have that sense of being left behind or that, you know, have don't have the economic advantages of certain other neighborhoods and you know hubbard for example um near englewood and lindblom uh sen um marie curie uh six six different schools every week one of our uh, professional singers goes in and teaches voice lessons to these kids and um that manifests itself in all kinds of ways uh, in terms of performance with us. So for example, uh, at our gala this year, we'll play our next music clip, which featured the Strong Voices uh, chorus. And whenever you're ready. <laughs> Okay, so that's uh, 200 kids that just popped up out of the blue. I think they used to call it flash mob appearances and then that became very old fashioned, but we still love it. I mean, everyone in the room that night were just knocked out by these uh, students coming in from the schools that we work with. And by the way, that's a Maroon 5 song. You might say, well, what does that have to do with Baroque music? It's based on Pachelbel's canon. And Pachel Bell, of course, is a Italian Baroque composer. Um, and uh, that bass line and that the accompaniment, of course, it's been jazzed up for the purposes of the arrangement. But um, it, uh, it's, it's an example of what I mean about this kind of bedrock idea. And so much have, has come from this era of music. OK, I'm getting a cue that I need to wrap it up soon. So we only have a couple of slides left. Um, so this next one is the casino. It's another club. Um, we, we have generous board directors who are members of clubs and they 
allow it for us to get into some of the most beautiful spaces here in Chicago. And this is where we launched our Baroque Forever Endowment Fund, because we haven't had a, an endowment fund up until now. And our goal is to um, establish a fund of three times our income, which would be $7.5 million. Our, our annual budget is about 2.5 million. So our goal is to establish a fund that will get us up there to three times that amount. We're just at the start of it now. Um, we've identified about uh, 1.6 million, but we feel we've, we're off to a good start. But um, you know, we want to secure our future. A lot of foundations are sunsetting, and it's very hard to open new doors to foundations, particularly when you're selling early music from the 18th century. So we're, we're constantly thinking of how can we be relevant to today? That's why we love our program with the young singers and why we love doing things like Baroque in the Park. And then for anyone who feels like going, taking a deeper dive with us, of course, that's our ultimate goal, that we'll have an audience into the future. Okay, um, quick whistle stop through the final few programs. In terms of our diversity work, it's important for us to employ musicians from underrepresented backgrounds in our orchestra, African-American, Hispanic, etc. And we do that... Um, uh, in uh, usually once a year for an entire week of rehearsals and concerts and here are some of the recent friends that we've made and of course by making those introductions to our orchestra our goal is to hire them back whenever we can and whenever a vacancy comes in the orchestra then we've already built a relationship so that over time we will see greater diversity on our stage uh, because it's our goal that we represent all of Chicago on our stage, in our audience, on our board, and um, we feel we're making some, some progress on that. The next slide shows a, uh, a collaboration with the Merritt School of Music, a Baroque specialty program. The, next, the slide after that is a, an example of a theater piece that we did on the uh, African, sorry, the French African composer uh, uh, Joseph Boulogne, otherwise known as the Chevalier de Saint-Georges. He was a contemporary of Mozart's. He was a master fencer, horseman, amazing musician, uh, violinist, uh, incredibly talented guy, led the first black regiment during the French Revolution. Um, and so we brought this theater and music production to uh, Austin as part of our neighborhood engagement program at the K Ryan Center. And we had great fun with that. Uh, that was the first night, the premiere of this work. And then the following night, the next slide shows us on the stage of Symphony Center. So we wanted to start in the neighborhood and then, but also bring it to the, the regular classical music uh, crowd in Chicago. And we, we had the collaboration with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and Jeff Alexander for that, which we very much appreciated. Um, the next uh, video is a collaboration with uh, the South Chicago Dance Theater. It's about a minute. Um, do we have time to play this or, or, or should, should I? Okay, so we, I'm getting a nod to say, yes, we should play it. So uh, it's another example of a collaboration um, in terms of engaging with other organizations and showing greater diversity on our stage. This is an amazing young company from South Chicago led by Kia Smith, South Chicago Dance Theater. We commissioned to work with her, so off we go. Okay, so that's an example of a work that was composed in 1610 by the German Baroque composer Michael Pretorius and modernized into 21st century Chicago with Kia Smith and her, and her, and her troupe of youthful uh, dancers. So clearly a modern choreography, but inspired by um, an older world of music. Uh, the next slide shows uh, some of the um, students. We have a program that's sponsored by William Blair. Uh, students go for free. So if you're a student, you attend our concerts for free at the Harris Theatre, and um, William Blair uh, supports that program. Uh, and finally, we come back to where we started, Baroque in the Park. This shows you the splendid night that we had in 2021. 
Um, and it was an important night for us because it was really our first comeback after after uh, COVID and all that did to all of us. So it was a big celebration to come back and do that night. And the final clip that I leave you with is, um, well, I'll let you, Dame Jane Glover explain. So um, we're going to play this from the beginning and then we're going to just jump to the final minute so you get a sense of the performance. It is simply wonderful to be back making music together and for you. And and basically, there's really only one word that best sums it up, isn't there? Hallelujah. And then we're going to play from 3.13 p.m. We had a few little technical delays in the picture just because we're going through uh, Zoom, but you you get the picture. Um, final uh, slide just says thank you, thank you for having us here today. Uh, this is actually the last concert of last season. Honestly, like all of us felt after COVID, we were so relieved just to make it to the end of a, a season um, that we wanted to um, thank the audience in a special way. So we 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 got our we got our chorus to hold up. Um, Thank you letters. Uh, so just to spell it out quite literally. Um, again, it's, uh, we love making new friends. And um, it's so nice to be here with you all today. Um, I said I'd talk about some of the challenges and opportunities in running a performing arts group in the Chicago of today. I think you picked up maybe a few of those along the way. I could elaborate further, but I'm conscious of the clock. And um, maybe uh, I should stop talking now. And <laughs> Targeted questions might bring out some of those some of those challenges. Sure. So do we have some questions in the room? A question back there. Hi, I'm Adriana. I'm also a musician, uh, but uh, I teach at Harold Washington College in the Humanities and Music Department, by the way. Uh, and thank you first, as I told your wife, about uh, having those uh, tickets sent to the student services for free. Other ways they will not be aware that that happened. Now, my question is related exactly to what you mentioned, how to bring this uh, type of music to the students today, and especially to inner city students, which is what I work with uh, and at college level. Uh, one of the things that I try to make them realize is the comparison of, well, yeah, mostly a comparison of how the jamming is in jazz and pop and the Baroque. So I wonder if you have been thinking about those possibilities and maybe bringing some of these uh, opportunities to Harold Washington, at least where I teach, you know, it's very close to your place. So just thinking about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for the question. And um, I know about your college and uh, we'd, we'd love to make friends. We've established uh, um, that now. So we'll, we'll continue with that. Um, in terms of uh, bringing young people in, you know, there's a general feeling that this, this is music that you grow into over time. You know, you can't expect teenagers, 20 year olds, 30 year olds to get it. Some of them do. But I think if you plant a seed in a young person's mind, it will come back much later in life. And that's what we're trying to do with the Strong Voices program. And also, um, you know, the, the when you actually use something that's relevant, like Maroon 5 as a performance piece, as opposed to a personal anthem uh, from, you know, four centuries ago, they make a connection because it's Maroon 5. And on the journey, they realize, but hang on, that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Pachelbel's canon. So we're constantly trying to explore new ways of communicating with our younger, the students. Um, bringing them to the concerts is, is a big thing for us. And 
decoding the music beforehand. So our colleague Jen Moore makes a makes a video um, before all our concerts, and we send that out to everybody who's going to the concert. So that's a great way of learning more and discovering more. So you go in already equipped with knowledge about who Bach was. Why did he write this piece? Why did Handel write this? Uh, you know, coronation anthem when he did, what was going on in life at the time, why do we all love it so much, etc. So, um, so I think there's all kinds of ways we can make connections. But we do think about it a lot, you know, in the in the digital age, in the world of artificial intelligence, will we get left behind? Uh, but I think people were saying that in the 20s and 30s, when cinemas first came about. And now, so many of those great old cinemas, for example, at the Pittsburgh Symphony, Heinz Hall, that was a that was a, a a movie house. So many of the great concerts hall in America today are now the homes of the great symphony orchestras in the great cities of America. So um, this music lasts. It does stand the test of time. Could all of that change now with the with the digital and artificial intelligence world? I don't think so because what you see on stage. Um, I mean, I guess it's a bit like really talented sports people. What you see with classical musicians and indeed other genres of musicians, when you see that level of ability and accomplishment, you realize that, that is a, that's a human thing that can never be imitated. And so therefore, I think it'll actually become more precious to us as we become more sophisticated in so many other ways. We will value and hang on to these human talents and you know that ability to communicate and to bring us to a, a higher sense of you know um going back to the the soul the soul music being in touch with deeper things um so i'm optimistic about the future uh and the students go for free is really effective it's really it's really catching on and i hope by planting a seed young in early in people's in young people's lives it will it will benefit us later this is a long investment <laughs> Yeah. Other questions in the room? Uh, let me just grab the mic a second here. Uh, any questions on Zoom? Shelby, are there any questions in the chat box? We do not have any questions at the moment. Then I'm going to ask a question. Oh, wait, no, we got it. We got a question. Pancho. Um, just, just give us a little taste of what we're going to hear next with the next season. Uh, we are going to open next season with, um, I talked about this combination of Baroque and early classical. So we're going to have Bach's Magnificat, a wonderful, optimistic, uplifting uh, choral piece, and then Mozart's Requiem. Uh, and, but we're going to do it at Symphony Center. Um, we usually perform at the Harris Theater, but we had such a great experience for the Chevalier program that I showed you the photo of that we'd like to go back. Um, so we're going to open our season there, and then throughout the season we've we usually do two or three really big Baroque works. So at Easter we'll be doing Bach St. John Passion. We just did the St. Matthew Passion. Next Easter we'll do the St. John Passion. We have a program called um, Birds, Frogs, Crickets and Dogs. Um, now this is a programming thing, um, and we're hoping to maybe collaborate and bring in some other organizations that might be interested in this, even organizations that have nothing to do with music, but have plenty to do with birds or animals. Um, so we're working on that. But a lot of Baroque music was written um, to celebrate or imitate the animal kingdom. Um, and so we have a Goldfinch concerto by Vivaldi. We have, of course, Vivaldi's um, four seasons the spring movement features birds it features a dog barking um we have telemann and his cricket uh symphony imitating the sound of the cricket and then there's um also by telemann a german uh contemporary of bach's we have this um frog inspired uh symphony so um this is just an example of finding you know hopefully attractive marketing <laughs> ways of bringing people in to discover the music more and um we also have our annual holiday programs in four chicago churches including saint michael this is a this is a trip through centuries of christmas music if you like from the eighth century right up until the 21st century but mainly renaissance and baroque music and then we'll be bringing uh, a very famous bach violinist victoria malova um or Mulova, i should say uh to our season in january as our featured international soloist 
um, there's another four concerts, but that that gives you that gives you uh, a little flavor. By the way, for everyone in the room, you've got a little brochure to take away, and and for everyone listening online and indeed here in the room, we would like to invite you all to our next concert. Um, which is our closing concert of the season, Circle of Friends at the Harris Theatre on Monday, the, I think it's the 8th of May. I'll just check that. Is Monday, is Monday, is, is the 8th of May a Monday? It's Monday the 8th of May. So please go online, uh, baroque.org, buy your ticket, but use the code ROTARY and you'll receive your tickets as complimentary as our guests. <laughs> Any other questions in the room? Maybe I can just ask really quickly, since you kind of teed it up, were there any other challenges you wanted to tell us about that you experienced as an organization? Yes, and uh, you know all about it, I'm sure, at Rotary, because I was reading a little bit from your president, Jennifer Jones, and uh, that wish to have uh, um, double figures in new members under the age of 40 and, and many more professional women so I second that we are we are looking for new board directors and uh, you know it's a challenge because people see music of the Baroque and they think well you know what, why would I ever you know want to serve on that board but you would be surprised you know um, how much there is to be gained. This is, this is a sales pitch now, but I really mean it. Um, you know, for, for executives, um, I think to serve two years on our board, honestly, it is a real career enhancing experience. You see so much of, you know, how the performance arts works, how marketing works in our world, um, you know, how education, um, our diversity, equity uh, program, all of that uh it's i believe it's a great opportunity of course we're all about music but we're also about the business of running a successful organization so um our goal is always to get people in to sample the concerts and then um top of the list in terms of new board directors we want you to turn up to eight concerts every year so that's 16 hours we want you to come to five board meetings that's another 10 hours and then we want you to come to our gala so it's a 30-hour investment time investment but i believe there's there's so much to be gained as a result of that so i would say that's our biggest challenge at the moment finding new directors and we need that for our future very good, very good. Well, thank you very much, Declan. Let's give him a round of applause. And before you step away, oh, it's here. We would like to give you the small token of our appreciation <laughs> from the Rotary Club of Chicago. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. And we will we'll see you on May 8th, right? All Please. right, very good. Please come. Everyone yes. welcome. Yes. Thank you. I put it in my calendar already. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. much. One more thank round you. of applause, please. All right, now we're gonna do some introduction of guests. Uh, so let's start in the room with any, well, I'm not sure that we have any visiting, do we have, we do have a visiting international Rotarian. Okay, no, no, that's, that's all right. Um, but I don't think, do we have any visiting international Rotarians? Okay, uh, then visiting domestic Rotarians. And then we'll, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you. My name is Bridget Thomas. I am visiting from the far, far destination of Wisconsin. I live in La <laughs> Crosse, and I'm in town. I actually have a meeting at two o'clock, a couple blocks away. So, well, this worked out perfectly. And I did not realize until I did a little more digging on your club that this is the first Rotary Club. So, I'm very excited to be here. I'm actually one of those new under 40 female members I just joined within the last year. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Welcome, welcome. Are there any other visiting Rotarians in the room? Um, how about on Zoom? Do we have any visiting international or uh, U.S. Rotarians? Feel free Eric, to I don't. I don't believe we do. But if we do have anyone, please unmute and introduce yourself. Okay. Well, not hearing anything. Um, then we'll move back to the room with. Uh, with our guests. Um, so I know we have several guests in the room. So uh, who wants to start? Um, 
<laughs> You'll all get a turn. Sorry to Don't grab worry. that from you. Um, I would like to bring back an old friend of our club, Elizabeth Mongami. Years ago, Elizabeth was, was with our Rotaract Club of Chicago. Um, she actually served on our admin team many, many years ago. And then she moved back to Zimbabwe to do her um, not-for-profit, Vanavefu, and um, has just recently returned to Chicago with, uh, to join the Mikva Challenge. And I'm going to let Elizabeth tell you a little bit about that. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I've been a Rotary baby since 1995. I joined um, my Interact Club in Zimbabwe, mainly to meet boys, but then <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there was that whole eradicating polio thing that I got involved <laughs> with. Um, I, I'm so excited to be back in Chicago. The weather never disappoints. It's still <laughs> super cold when you're expecting it to be warm, but I'm back now working for the Mick the challenge. I'm their director of major gifts and I've just been with them for two months. So still quite new, but really excited to be back and also excited that the club is down the street from my office and I hope to see a lot more of everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have this table over here. Hi, my name is Paul Piero. I'm a uh, prospective member and I appreciated the opportunity to uh, come to the meeting today. Um, as far as volunteer work, I worked for the public defender during law school for about a year and a half. And then before that, I did some volunteering in high school, such as uh, you know providing food to uh, people that needed it. Very good. Well, thanks for joining. We hope to see you back Thank again. You. Um, I know, I know I saw you sneak in back there, Liz. <laughs> Welcome back. Thanks. I'm Liz Jaswick. I was here last week. That's why I was like, wow. Um, uh, I am also a member of the Union League Club, and I am obviously seriously thinking about becoming a member since I'm here twice in a row. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Thank you very much. And, and then how about our uh, Declan's guests here as well? You don't get off that easy. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm Jason Gibbon. I'm the, uh, the development uh, uh, director for Music of the Broke. So in simple terms, I beg money for a living. Uh, <laughs> and make sure that the music is, uh, is funded. So uh, I've been uh, with the organization since 2019. So. Very good. Welcome. Hi, I'm Angela McLaughlin, and I'm here with some of my colleagues, as well as my husband. Um, <laughs> so I am association manager with Chicago Association Management with um, Ed Graziatno's company. And as I just said, I'm also uh, Declan's partner in crime here in Chicago. And um, I've often spent my Tuesdays at lunchtime listening to your meetings on Zoom. And I must say, I really enjoy them. So I feel quite privileged to be here in person today. So thank you. Thank you very much. And is there anybody else I'm missing on Zoom? Any other guests? OK, well, not hearing any. Uh, let's go on to our upcoming committee meetings uh, in, in that slide. And while we're looking at what uh, upcoming meetings we have, instead of me telling you what's been going on with the committees, why don't we have the committee chairs uh, come on up? So maybe uh, Sarah and Alita and Shada, if you want to come up and just give us like the 30 second spiel on uh, what you guys have been up to in your various committees, I think that'd be good. Whoever gets here first gets to go first. <laughs> Ready, go. Still not taller. Uh, um, so I'm the chair of job one. And so we just had our first training with our students, which is very interesting and always fun to do um, and see their little faces go. Oh, that's important. You know, social media is important to me getting a job. Yes, it is. Um, so we are still looking for employers and we do need um, members to come to our next um, job one training on April 29th because we're doing resume reviews with the students. So we would like to pair them up one on one with someone to go over their resume and start getting them ready for the job fair. Thank you. Thank you, Alita. Sarah? 
<laughs> Hi, I am Sarah Buck. I'm co-chair of the Community Service Committee, and we just had a service uh, event last night. Uh, Eric, myself, and Alita uh, were working with Snow City Arts. Um, they are a group that provides art therapy as well as music therapy, which I didn't realize, um, to children who are who are ill. Um, and so we did uh, some very fast bag packing and then we got really slowed down cutting out animals so they um i know that doesn't make any sense out of context but uh <laughs> they they have a you know they weren't live animals they um they have this project coming up where they are um they're going to take the kids to the zoo that's sort of what i understood right they're going to the zoo and they're so they have all these paper animals that the kids could like cut apart and then put together like a brand new animal using other like animal parts. So our job was to cut a lot of animals and uh, it's been a long time since we've used safety scissors actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was April's service event. Um, so our committee meets on the first Thursday of each month and uh, we try to have a service project um, once per month. We did just uh, approve the Jesse White Trunk Party. That is one of the major events that this club works with each year. That is in July. So um, I'm starting to plug it now. The Jesse White Trunk Party um, assembles kind of going away kits for uh, freshmen in college. There's 500 of them. And so it's like linens and laundry detergent and, and things that you would need in a dorm room. So that'll be coming up in July. And then also a heads up, um, I'll be working on the uh, now has become annual Chicago River cleanup in June. That's become a popular event. Um, so we do that by kayak and that'll be in June. Thank you. bring the mic down <laughs> all right hi everybody so uh i am shayda calderwood uh co-chair of the international service we are busy as well so a few projects that we just recently worked on was um healthcare project uh, for the ultrasound machine in uh, margarita venezuela Another project that we are, uh, we just finalized supporting um, equipment for the uh, detection of genetic mutations for Argentina. Other project that we worked on in Brazil, communal kitchen school um, and the x-ray machine for a hospital in Bolivia. Uh, and then the Turkey earthquake support rotary uh, container village. We supported a container from our club and uh, Jennifer Jones actually this week in Istanbul. Um, I think he'll be, she'll be visiting the locations uh, that earthquake happened. And lastly, um, we are finalized. We're the international partner of the Cryobank and Ukraine uh, project and uh, finalized, uh, finally approved, all good to go. So we're excited to get that going and uh, seeing in action. And we'll be sharing some photos with that too. Thank you. Well, for our guests, you can see we have a few things going on, <laughs> as we normally do. Even if we don't talk about them in this meeting, there's always a lot of committee meetings going on, and that's kind of where all the action happens there. So um, as you do get involved with the club, I encourage you to quickly get involved with one of those committees that you just heard from today. We also have other committees that focus on, on marketing, uh, DEI, membership, and, and so forth. Um, so in terms of, well, actually, I have one more thing I wanted to ask of all of you. Um, so I'm programs chair these days for the, uh, for the club, and obviously uh, we continue to get really fantastic speakers in here to the club. If you want to continue to see that caliber of speaker, if you have folks that uh, you can think of who might be great speakers, please suggest them to me, and we will uh, try to bring them in here. Um, and then with that, to wrap up our meeting, we'll do the four-way test, but uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to call on you uh, to come on up and tell us what Rotary's, uh, Rotary's all about, and not just boys. <laughs> <laughs> Got it on the screen right next to you there. I too. should know it off by heart. 
Rotarians, if you'll join me in, hey, so, sorry, so Marshall, Rotarians, if, you, if you'll join me in saying the four-way test um, of the things we think, do, and say. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Is it fun? <laughs> All right. And with that, meeting adjourned.